Our Estuary, sponsored by the Humber Nature Partnership and BP Chemicals. to our estuary. Over the past five episodes, we've travelled the length and breadth of the Humber estuary, still only scratching the surface of this incredible area. I've met an eel fisherman, I've climbed the lighthouse at Spurn Point, and we've seen some of the Humber's more important natural habitats. But as Sarah says, we're still only beginning to uncover the potential of this area. I visited the retro idyll of the Humberston Fitties, and met some of the estuary's wild inhabitants. The industry of the area is also something we've looked at, with former industrial sites providing exciting new opportunities for nature reserves, such as far rings or North Cave wetlands. All the way along the Humber, you can visit some really wonderful places to take the family or to have a coffee, such as the unique Rope Walk Centre in Barton. And where else would you find such an impressive walk as the Viking Way? Later in the show, I'll be visiting a major industrial hub on the Humber, the Salt End Chemicals Park. And I'll be visiting an 18th century woodland near Killingham. But first, I'm off to Water's Edge to enjoy some of the walks available for both Humber residents and their canine friends. Humber Hounds is a local initiative for dog walkers, dedicated to help owners and their dogs to enjoy the Humber estuary, whilst protecting this special area and its wildlife. I'm here at the Water's Edge Visitor Centre to meet Gordon Kell of the Humber Nature Partnership and his dog Nelson to find out more about this fantastic scheme. Come on Kira. Ah, morning Gordon. Morning, Kira. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. And this must be Nelson. That's Nelson. <laughs> Kira. Yes, yeah. Kira, yes. So Gordon, tell me a bit more about this scheme. I'm eager to know more. Yeah, it's got a background to it because we did um, we did some studies across the estuary about uh, how recreational activities interact with world wildlife. And one of the things that came out of that was really to do with birds. And we discovered one of the main issues is dog walking, <laughs> particularly dogs off the lead as well. Mm. So my colleague um, Tanya began this scheme called the Humber Hounds. It's a local scheme. Uh, there are other schemes like it throughout the country, so we did copy <laughs> from what I think was done down in the south of England. Right. Uh, and what we do is we, um, we have a programme of events, monthly events, where we'll walk across the uh, estuary, um, or rather along the estuary. Right. Um, uh, we've done the, a lovely walk across the front of the estuary here. We've done one over the bridge. We also have uh, Sarah, who's a, a volunteer dog uh, trainer, and she's done things like dog uh, first aid, uh, dog psychology wow. uh, and we have a site here that we, we go and do that at. Yeah. Uh, so at the moment it's proving quite successful and the, the idea is to develop it and to stretch it further across the, uh, the estuary both on the north and south banks. So these walks, do they cover the whole length and breadth of the Humber? No, to be honest at the moment it's based around Barton right. um, although as I say we do go across to the north bank via, via the bridge. Um, but what we'd like to do is now look at other parts of the estuary and really kind of replicate what we're doing here. So we're very interested if people in other parts of the estuary contact us mm. uh, if they're interested in this kind of programme and we'll, we'll certainly try and, uh, try and accommodate it. And how do they contact you? Uh, they go through the website. If they go through to uh, www.humbernature.co.uk uh, then they can communicate with us through the website and we'll make contact and make the arrangements. So the current membership, um, have you got many people signing up for this? Yes, we, we have a lot of people who uh, go through our Facebook page and, um, but when it comes to actual walk then I would think, uh, certainly I've been with groups when there's been more than 20 and certainly at least 15 or so dogs, you know, mm. so it's, uh, and very enthusiastic as well. So. Mm. Um, uh, and there's more and more new members coming along. And what sort of examples uh, of the walks are there then? Well, we've done some very nice walks through the country park here. Oh. Um, we did a lovely evening walk uh, from, um, from New Holland through to Barrowhaven and then stopped at the, um, the Ferry Inn 
and then walked back again and that was a beautiful evening because uh, as we were finishing the walk the sun was setting over the bridge uh, and then um, we've done the walk over the bridge as well which is, is very um, it's very uh, popular yeah. uh, but you need, you need good weather uh, <laughs> because as you know it can be very cold <clears> up there um, so yeah we've got some uh, very interesting walks around this side of the of the estuary but there's a nice variety around here yeah. and I would say the walks are between um, a half an hour to an hour and a half right um, and we do it at a pace which people can join in because yeah. there's a mixture of ages we have children we have um, older people as well so we, we, we pace it fine well let's, let's get go. going what's <laughs> what we're stopping for come okay, on okay go on Nelson come on Kira ah. there we go come on Today I'm at the Sultan Chemicals Park, just outside Hull on the banks of the Humber. This is one of the longest established and largest industrial sites on the Humber and I'm off to find out a bit more about it. I'm here with Malcolm Joslin, who's BP's Communications Manager on site. Welcome Malcolm, thanks for joining us. Could you just tell us a little bit about uh, who's here, which businesses are based here and what they do? Yes, it's called Sultan Chemicals Park these days because it is a multi-operator site. So we have two very large plants of BP operate that make acetic acid, which most people know in its dilute form as vinegar. But there are several other operators here making other chemicals, um, Ineos, the Japanese company, Nippon Gosai. We also have air products here and a power station <coughs> behind us, which is owned by GDF Gulf Suez. And the power station feeds the site with power? Yes, so the reason we bought the power station here in 2000 was to allow us to have cheaper steam and electricity, which are the things that really drive the processes on site. And, and it was a really important step in a complete redevelopment of, of the site over several years after that. Something like about half a billion pounds worth of investment in, in several years since then. And clearly this is a very significant site and has been for a long time. Um, I understand that you've recently had your centenary um, can you just give us an idea why this site was here in the first place, why the location was strategic? Yes, it's the centenary because on the 27th of May 1914, the first cargo of oil was uh, imported from the Salten Jetty. And it's really the Salten Jetty um, is, is the reason that we're, we're here at all, because it gives us um, access to the deep water channel for imports and exports. So it was originally oil storage but then the first chemicals came in 1924 when an American built a distillery and that was using molasses which was also imported um, across the jetty. So our, our, our links with the Humber Estuary have been absolutely vital for the whole 100 years of our site history. How do you manage the impact of the business? Does your business have any significant detrimental impact on the estuary? This is, this is clearly something you have to take into account. Could you explain a bit about that? Yes, we, we've, we've been sort of challenging ourselves um, for a good 20-25 years in terms of um, are, are we having an impact on the estuary. So we've been having um, bird studies on the mudflat since probably 1991 and they've actually showed us that there's an incredible amount of bird life, probably more so because we have industry here and we restrict the amount of access um, along the sea wall so there's less disturbance. But it certainly is a challenge when you then come to build new projects such as the power station and we have worked very closely over the years with the environmental consultees particularly to come up with ways that we can construct the plants without having any adverse impact on the birds. So you would see this as a, a flagship uh, operation in terms of its environmental management? I, th I think it's a really great example uh, of, of where you can have major construction, major development right next to an environmentally important site and yet come up with ways that you can do that without, without having an impact. So I, th I think it's, it's, it's really worked. It's really worked very well and a lot of people cooperated to make sure it happened. Well thanks for that Malcolm. 
and we're now going to go and have a look around the park ourselves to see what it's all about. So in the distance behind us, we can see the bioethanol plant, and I gather that this is the most recent venture to get going on the park. That's right, it's a, a joint venture. Uh, it's called Vivergo Fuels, and the joint venture is between BP Biofuels, DuPont, and British Sugar. And it's using wheat from the local area, from Lincolnshire and East Yorkshire, and converting that into bioethanol, which in turn gets put into petrol up to 5% to help make the, uh, the fuels in our vehicles environmentally friendly. Hmm. And the bioethanol, this is exported from the site uh, via ships? That's right, it's something else that's um, going out via the jetty. So everything started 100 years ago with bringing in um, oils across the jetty. We're still using the jetty extensively 100 years later, maybe five or six ships a day, uh, usually shuttling between here and, and Antwerp, and then things get distributed on into Europe from there. Well, thanks very much. And I hope that's given everyone at home an insight into this very significant operation on the shores of the Humber. Our Estuary, sponsored by the Humber Nature Partnership and BP Chemicals. Our Estuary, sponsored by the Humber Nature Partnership and BP Chemicals. <laughs> I'm here with Tom Lane, an archaeologist who spent many years with Heritage Lincolnshire. So Tom, what is important about this area to the production of salt over the centuries? Well, this, uh, this area, we're, and we're between Marsh Chapel and the sea, this was a real hive of activity in the medieval period. And the mounds that you can see behind me and all around me, they um, are the waste material from a huge salt making industry that was uh, around here in the medieval period. Talk us through the timeline of, of the salt making industry in this area. In the, in the Bronze Age, say about, about 700 BC, that sort of thing, the site um, from Tetney, would, um, all they found really there was the, the remains, the clay remains from the, from the boiling pans. Um, so it, it, the process isn't exactly certain, but we do know from uh, other sites that's been excavated in the Fens and down towards um, Skegness that at that time and right through into the into the Roman period, um, it was really the, the capturing of seawater and uh, letting that settle in little clay tanks and then boiling that up in in clay pans really to to crystallize the salt and that was uh, it's a fairly inefficient um, method of doing it it's a different method to what was happening just where we're standing now but um, uh, salt was made in in huge quantities though in the, in the Roman period onwards because it was a very important I mean most people think of it as just a, a condiment on the table to sprinkle on your chips but in fact it was um, one of the most important discoveries ever because it allowed people to preserve meat and fish. People who actually made the salt, I think, were local people. They, it, it, was a, it was a kind of part-time thing in a way in that they didn't do it for the entire year, all, all through the year. Um, when they were doing it, it was pretty intensive, but uh, I think they all had small holdings and little farms and that, as far as we can tell from the, the sort of probate inventories, you know, the wills and things like that. Um, so, yeah, they would be very active making the salt, generally in the summer period, and probably collecting some of the, the mud from the foreshore as well later on. But um, it didn't bring enormous amounts of people um, to do seasonal work like, uh, like 
it might do to Skegness now yeah. or something like that. But uh, there were quite a few people, quite a few families involved, yeah. Was it a viable industry, would you say? Um, it, it was at its peak, yeah, it was at its heyday, it certainly was. And, um, and it was moved out in great loads from... There was a lot of little um, estuaries um, down this coast, places like Saltfleet, so the, the ships would come in and bring... Um, bring peat which they fired it with and then they would take the salt out to to the likes of um, Great Yarmouth and, and Scarborough and abroad sometimes as well um, so it, it was quite a it was quite a big industry at the time but obviously as it um, as time went on it, it did peter out yeah so obviously there is um, an area down in Essex Malden that, that do produce salt now but are there any other areas that that do the traditional, use the traditional way? Yeah, there's just a couple in this country, but um, it's very, uh, it's not in any way like it used to be. I mean, there is rock salt industry in uh, Cheshire and Worcestershire, uh, but that is mined, that's rock salt that, uh, that is mined, so that's a different thing. That's the salt that gets spread on the roads. Yeah. And that, and um, I mean, elsewhere in the world, you know, if you go to hot countries, they have an advantage in that the sun shines all the time and it, uh, it crystallises the salt and uh, you don't have to have all this problem with uh, what fuel to use and buying the fuel and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, wherever there's, uh, there's hot sun, there's people that tend to make salt, yeah. Thanks very much for that, Tom. I'd have passed these mounds and not even known what was there. I'm here at the remarkable Chalk Pebble Beach at South Ferriby. This is a very unusual beach with a gleaming white strand which is made of chalk pebbles, mostly quite small, and there was chalk mined here from very early times. This is a very ancient place and on a still day like today it feels much as it must have done thousands of years ago. South Ferriby, which is ahead of us, was a substantial Roman settlement and there have been hordes of gold found along this section of the Humber. There was a ferry across here from very ancient times with 4,000 year old ferry boat remains discovered on the far bank at North Ferriby. And behind me there is the remains of one ship that didn't make it off the beach. As you can see, I'm here today completely by myself. This beach is a bit inaccessible and there's a bit of a walk to get to it, but I think you'll agree with me this is one of those unique places on the Humber. Woodland management is crucial in this 120 acre woodland called Birkinshaw's Covert. Regular volunteer work takes place which includes tree felling, planting and path track and ride clearance. Students at the local Oasis Academy have planted well over 2,000 trees. I'm here to meet two representatives of this interesting site which is just on the perimeter of the Lindsay Oil Refinery here in Killingholme. Hello. Hello Sarah. Alan. Nice to meet you. Kevin, great Hi. to meet you. Thanks very much for seeing me. So, um, Alan, I, I understand you're a conservation officer at Humber Nature Partnership. That's right, yeah, yeah. Can you explain the origins of this beautiful woodland? Well, this part is the old covert, which is late 18th century, early 19th century game covert. It was planted on the old medieval rig and furrow. Um, but the bulk of the woodland is the plantation woodland that was put in in the 1960s when the uh, refinery was developed as a screen for missions and for visual screen for the place. So we've got a mix of woodland, some of the older woodland and then the newer woodland 
the older woodland we're trying to preserve, preserve the medieval field system that's underneath it. Uh, we can be a lot more liberal with the, the new woodland because the poplars mature and we're selling that and putting the money back into conservation. So we've got a very diverse woodland with the, the rides that are going in and, um, and special things like this. This is, the, uh, this is what they call a monolith and deadwood, hollow trees and things like that, standing deadwood are particularly valuable for bats and bats are one of the things that we're trying to conserve in here. And um, what we've done with this sycamore tree, which is a non-native invasive tree, uh, we've delimbed it to try and keep it stable because we've, uh, we've killed it with uh, glyphosate and ring barked it so that tree will die or is dead and then we've put deep fissures into the tree with a chainsaw right up into the tree in a number of places to create artificial bat roosts and then the bats will feed on the rides that we've put in, the ponds that we're putting in shortly. So we're doing quite sort of quirky things in here, uh, especially for biodiversity, because it is a, a local wildlife site and it's not available to the public. Um, all of the funding relates directly to nature conservation. Anything else that you can tell us about this area? Yeah, we'll have a look at one or two interesting nuggets. Okay, let's go. What are we looking at here? This is the uh, another interesting part of the woodland where you've got the sort of ancient history of the site with the medieval field system preserved under the enclosure woodland. Uh, but this part of the site, which was planted in the uh, late 18th, early 19th century, um, was cut down in 2002 for the 400 kV power line and the old field system was completely destroyed at that time. Now what National Grid have, have kindly done, have, uh, they came back in 2012 at uh, our request and um, we cleared the site again and then reinstated the medieval rig and furrow to continue on from the original and the idea of that is to provide the conservation grassland for the deer and other you know, mammals, the places for the owls, bats, kestrels and everything to you know, the raptors to feed across it on the small mammals that are, that are in the woodland. And the furrows themselves have kept water all year round, some of them, so that's valuable uh, aquatic uh, breeding habitat for amphibians. So again it's a, a very successful part of the project and one of the objectives to increase the orchid numbers in the site has, be, has uh, worked marvellously. I mean we get a lot of um, uh, common spotted orchid in this site already and we're hoping that the marsh orchid and um, bee orchid things like that will eventually come in. I mean who would have thought that they would have been here in the shadow of this refinery? I know not many people get the chance to see this, so I feel really privileged, thank you. If you'd like to find out more about any of the items on today's show, please go to www.estuary.tv forward slash Our Estuary. Our Estuary, sponsored by the Humber Nature Partnership and BP Chemicals.